contract calling for a percentage of the next town. They'd already had troubles, and the evidence will show you, and you can just think about this. He's here in Los Angeles, and they have a chance, let's say, to go to Sweden for three days. They've got to take him, his roadie, his equipment. He, he has to fly first class, but his manager can fly second class, and fly them over for a week's tour. It becomes very difficult to bring your keyboard player under those circumstances. And in some cases, they're only going to promote an album, so it's a loss anyway. In any event, they sent him a contract calling for payment by the week to the extent that he worked on the album Keys to the Kingdom. And in fact, that contract was signed. And he was paid by the week, and he was used very little. The evidence will show he contributed very little to that album. In fact, as the evidence will show, except for playing the keyboards, he contributed very little to the other Moody Blues album. For example, during the time that Mr. Mraz was performing with the Moody Blues, some 40 to 55 songs were written by the Moody Blues and were played on the albums. Mr. Mraz wrote one half of one of those songs. Now, Mr. Mraz was disappointed very disappointed by receiving no percentage of the royalties on the album Keys to the Kingdom, and as, as in the, his attorneys said so. In fact, you will see from the voluminous correspondence that we will show you that Mr. Mraz's attorneys complained constantly and took very strong legal positions on behalf of Mr. Mraz about almost everything, the types of things I told you about, other things. But you will see nothing in the letters complaining when Mr. Mraz was offered and signed a contract to get a weekly salary for the keys to the kingdom. You'll see nothing in there saying, gee, Mr. Mraz had an oral deal made in 1980 that he'd be a Moody Blues indefinitely and would share in all albums and tours. There's no writing making that complaint. In fact, in this case, there's no claim. Mr. Mraz is saying he was underpaid by some dollars, which we don't know yet the amount. Someday uh, we may have some testimony on that. But he claims he was underpaid on the other four albums. He never made a claim before this case. But even in this case, he's making no claim on Keys to the Kingdom. He got his weekly salary, and that was it. In fact, what Mr. Mraz had a new attorney by that time. He'd come here. And his attorney in this country wrote and said, well, you know, he's not getting any money on that, but we hope that he'll get his usual one-fifth when he goes on tour. And those are the decisions you have to make. Is this, is this conduct consistent with a claim that was made in this case that he was a Moody Blue for life and was entitled to every deal, whether he made a contract or not? And, they, and, and Mr. Mraz and Mrs. Mraz have already testified, and will testify here, that every single tour and every single album had a separate written contract. All right, we're in studio once again with Marty Gold. <coughs> Marty, let me just go through a little article that was written about Donald Engel in Trial Digest, at which time he's talking about opening statements. And he says, establish your credibility early on. Don't talk down to the jurors be straightforward, be organized. Was he all of these things and what you just saw? Well, I think he was all of those, those things, mm -hmm. and I think it was an effective uh, opening statement. Mm -hmm. uh, to my taste, it was, again, as in the case of the plaintiff's opening, a little longer than was necessary for this case. Um, but what he did in a very organized fashion um, was uh, to set out what the testimony is that's on the basis of which he's going to come back at the end of the case and argued to the jury that there's no basis uh, for them to sustain the plaintiff's claims. So that's why his, uh, his uh, opening statement is effective. How important do you, as, as a litigator yourself, rate opening statements? Sometimes I, I know some lawyers pass them up. What do you think? I think it's an enormous mistake to pass them up. I find them to be very important uh, for the reasons that Don Engel gives in the article that you alluded to. 
setting up that credibility. Well, right. he's laid out a, uh, what this case is all about. Both sides have. We want to get into it now with our first uh, witness. keyboard player that you utilized on the Octave Tour. And Patrick Moraz. How did uh, Mr. Moraz uh, come to uh, work on that tour? You know, uh, he was introduced to by Graham Edge, who'd, who'd um, seen the first time I saw Patrick was uh, in uh, the Decca studio when we were uh, looking for a keyboard player. Looking for a keyboard player. Was that the first time you heard Patrick Moraz's name? Yeah. In the in the studio? Yeah. You didn't even know that. I mean, you were never consulted on, as to who would be auditioning? I was told, that, that, but I'd never heard of Patrick Moraz before that. Who told you that Patrick Moraz was going to be uh, auditioning for the movies? Graham did. Graham Edge. Was Graham... How did Graham end up in the position of, as the uh, person who was, uh, what I'm gathering, apparently in charge of engaging potential keyboard players? I don't think it was just Graham. I think he just came up and he said, this guy is, has, he's, he's spoken to this guy and uh, we ought to... Uh, uh, we missed, we missed part, the first part of the statement. What did he say? He said he'd, he'd uh, met, met with this guy and uh, we ought to listen to him play. And did you have any input then? Did, do you know of any, uh, whether any of the other Moody Blues, Justin Hayward or John Lodge, had any input into the uh, auditioning of Moraz? Oh, we all went uh, to the studio that day. I mean, leading up to the studio, was there... I, I honestly don't know. I would, uh, you know, I, was, I presume that Graham would have told. Well, what role were you taking in the management of the group's affairs in 1978? What did Ray Thomas do? Well, we hadn't worked together for such a long time, and uh, losing Mike abruptly, we were li literally people were just keeping their their ears to the ground, looking and you know and listening for a, a keyboard player. Are you saying then that it was each of you had each of you was out? Well, speaking to people and explaining what we were looking for. Yeah. Who did you speak to or come up with in terms of a potential keyboardist for the Moody Blues? Well, I didn't. Patrick was there before us. Who, who did Justin Hayward come up with as a potential no keyboardist? I think I think Patrick was uh, one of the one of the first people that I that, that I saw. In fact, I think he was the only person I saw. Who did John Lodge come up with as a potential keyboardist for the Moody Blues? I have no idea. Isn't it true that in fact no one was considered to replace Michael Pinder on the octave? tour other than Patrick Moraz. That's what I'm saying. Patrick came along and we listened to him play. When did you find out that Moraz was going to be auditioning it? Right at the studio? And oh no, it's a couple of days before. And what were exactly... Mr. Johnson, that's just a, a surprise witness. <laughs> All right, we are listening to Ray Thomas. He is, of course, one of the Moody Blues. He's 51 years old, a singer, flute player. He's worked for a while as an engineer with the group, but gave it up, um, before the group, gave it up to join the band. He's divorced with a daughter, two daughters and one son. And uh, he's giving testimony now about when Mr. Morass entered and in, joined the band. Let's go back and what join him now. What were you told now. about Morass? Those two days before, what 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 did Graham convey to you about this gentleman you were going to meet, Moraz? Not a great deal, really. He said he'd, he'd uh, spoken to Patrick, <coughs> and Patrick had uh, explained to him that he knew of the Moody Blues and uh, knew their music, and I presume Big Graham told him what was expected of him musically, and said we ought to uh, see him play. Do you remember having any discussions as to what kind of a deal should be offered to the keyboard player who was going to go out on the octave tour? Not at that time, no. How long had you been looking for a keyboard player before Moraz was auditioned? I think it was only a matter of uh, months, I should think. 
In other words, in a two month or so period, you never auditioned anybody other than Moraz. No. And it was also fairly urgent that you needed to find a keyboard player at that time, right? Well, well not really, no. I mean, we, we hadn't worked or been on the road for such a long time, and we wanted to go out and, to, and obviously promote the album, but there was no great uh, rushing around or urgency about it. What did, uh, did, 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 did Graham or anybody tell you of Moraz's musical uh, history at that time? He said he played with Yes. And well, did that mean anything to you? Well, I've heard of Yes. What have you heard of Yes? Well, I, I knew of Rick Wakeman, but I wasn't really a Yes fan. It wasn't really my, uh, my cup of tea. <coughs> I knew he'd, he'd replaced Rick Wakeman for a while. Rick Wakeman was a keyboardist in Yes. That's right. And yes, in 1970, late 76, 77, 78, was a pretty big group, wasn't it? That's right. One of the biggest groups in the world at that time, right? Oh, so I'm told. And they were playing big stadiums and arenas, weren't they? Yeah. All right, let's go to the audition then. Where was the audition, do you remember? Yeah, it was at uh, Decca One Studios, which was uh, Decca at... at loaned to us and uh, which in effect was the uh, which, which was the fresh old studio at the meeting a couple days before when you met with graham did he tell you that he had discussed with moraz the possibility of a permanent position with the moody blues no no permanent position okay what occurred at the audition i think the first thing we played was tuesday afternoon and uh and I disagree with the fact that Patrick had to show us how to play it. We'd played it for a number of years before that. You, dis you disagreed with, why don't you continue? I, was, well, I disagree with the fact that Patrick had to teach us how to play it. We'd played it for years before. Uh, it wasn't Tuesday afternoon. It was Legend of a Mind, which you wrote, didn't you? I thought it was Tuesday. I know we played Legend too, and and Night and White Saturday we played several Moody Blues compositions. Did Patrick Moraz have to show you at that audition how to play your own song, Legend of a Mind? No. And you played about what four or five songs? Yeah, I, I, as far as I recall, yeah. Moraz played them all just fine. Yeah. And he was asked to go on the tour. That's correct. Did he go on the tour? Yes. What was the terms of his arrangement? I wasn't involved in that. Why not? I just left the business side to uh, people who knew more about it. Who would that be? The rest of the guys. Is that because you are not interested in business or you're not inter uh, not capable or what's the reason that you didn't? I think they, they have got a better understanding of it than I have. say that Graham, Justin, and uh, John Lodge took care of the arrangements with Moraz? Yeah. Did they, what did they tell you about the arrangements that they had made with Moraz, if anything? Well, everything was fine. I mean, it suited everybody concerned. Did you learn then that he was uh, going to be paid as an equal member, or was he getting a salary, or how was his being compensated? I believe it was a salary at the time. Now, were you at, at all involved in that, or did you just leave it to the other three? I just left it to the other three. Do you know how much he was, in fact, paid? <coughs> Not a fan, no. How long did he perform under that arrangement where he was paid as a, on a kind of a salary basis? I so I wasn't involved in it, so I, I honestly don't know. Well, are you aware at any time that the relationship ever changed so that he w did not become a salaried person? On the road? Yes. I think it was after that first two. When? Well, afterwards. There was so many, so many bills being run up and there was more money. He was getting more money than we were. or we spending a lot more money. And it was just better that you know, we had equal, an equal shot. You had 
It was at this point that Judge Boland declared a recess for the day. We'll take a break, and when we return, we'll have the next day's testimony. Stay with us. Welcome back. It is now day two in the trial of Mraz versus the Moody Blues, and we have Mr. Ray Thomas, who is one of the Moody Blues, is on the stand. He has been testifying as to uh, when Mr. Mraz joined the band, some of the business dealings uh, that went on uh, around that particular time. So let's join him now. Was there a discussion as to whether or not Mraz should be should receive a communication that he was no longer welcome? But he wasn't going on the tour. Right. Yeah, we decided that Tom would tell him. Who decided that? I think we all did. Who brought it up? Who said the word? Let's <coughs> have Tom do it. I can't recall. I don't recall. It, just, it just seemed the obvious thing to do as Patrick was in Los Angeles and so was Tom. Tom could see him face to face. Isn't it a big problem having Tom Hewlett in Los Angeles? I mean, you have a problems with Patrick Mraz living in Los Angeles. How about having your manager in Los Angeles? Yeah, our manager hasn't got to play keyboards on a, on, a, on a show somewhere else, is he? Well, tell me every occasion, I mean, every occasion where it caused a problem that Patrick Mraz was living in Los Angeles. There was uh, European television dates which we have to go to very quickly, more or less at the drop of that. It could be like tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, which would be impossible. Any other situations you can remember? No, sir. All right, what specific European TV dates are you speaking of now that you had to turn down or couldn't do or did do without Mraz? I think we did two in Ireland. I, I can remember, I can't remember the names of the shows. And in fact, you were setting up those dates weeks in advance, weren't you? Three or four weeks you knew about those Holland, those Dutch dates, didn't you? I didn't know. But the office did, didn't it? I kind of <laughs> Have you read Wynn Mather's deposition? No. Nope. Are you aware that Wynn Mather has given me documents, correspondence between Polygram Records, your record company, and the, and the Dutch TV show showing that there were three weeks, four weeks notice. Some strikes not notice. That he's aware of it? Or that, or that this documentation exists? Well, he, counsel is again testifying. Uh, the, the implication of the question is that uh, the documentation exists and it's not, a, it's not proper cross-examination. The question is whether or not he's seen any documents. All right. As rephrased, questions permitted. No. All right. And those, do you remember when those Dutch TV shows occurred? What year? Well, before the tour, so I was 91, I should imagine. So you mean to tell me that the way it works on TV shows in Europe is that somebody calls you up and in 24 hours you're supposed to like show up in another country and, and appear? It certainly can do, yeah. Well, tell me every time you've done that ever in the last <coughs> five to seven years on 24 hours notice. I can't recall it. I'm just saying it's just very, it can be very quick, that's what I said. Why was Martin Wyatt at the meeting if he doesn't... Oh, I see. When he, he just... He works for Tom Mueller. Why was he at the threshold meeting? As I explained, we were discussing going into Europe. And he was, he was employed to arrange the European link. After the meeting, the 20-minute meeting, in which uh, it was determined that Mraz would not be invited on the tour, did you communicate or see anybody communicate with Mr. White or, or Ms. Mather about the fact that Mraz was no longer going to be with the Moody Blues? No, I didn't know. Why haven't you ever called Mraz since he was terminated from the Moody Blues? I didn't know where he was living. You couldn't have gotten his phone number from the threshold office? I had no reason to. On a personal level, you 
Did you ever think about maybe I should communicate it, it, it wasn't ringing me. Excuse me? It didn't ring me. He should have called you. No, I didn't say that. Are you aware of the phone call that Mraz, of any phone call that Mraz subs had subsequent to that meeting with any of the other Moody Blues? No. So you're not aware that he, he spoke with uh, Justin Hayward? I believe, I believe he did, yeah, but I don't know what the content of that conversation was. Right, you weren't interested in knowing? I just didn't, I didn't find out. Did you, you just didn't, did you ask anybody? No. Were you at all concerned about Mraz's welfare or well-being when the decision was made not to continue with Mraz? Well, last, uh, last I heard of Patrick, he was doing very well writing film scores in Hollywood. Well, how, tell me. All right, we're going to take a brief pause and come back and continue with that testimony. Please stay with us. Welcome back. We're going to rejoin Ray Thomas. This is day two in the case of Mraz versus the Moody Blues, and Mr. Thomas is concluding his testimony in this particular case. Did Graham Edge ever tell you that he had told Mraz that he was a permanent member of the band? Oh. <coughs> Graham never told me that. No. Did he ever tell you that he wanted Mraz to be a permanent member? I don't think so. All right, your deposition, page 22, line 6 through 9. Question. Did Graham Edge ever tell you that he had told Mraz that he was a permanent member of the band? Answer. He told me he'd like him to. Yeah. You've changed your testimony today. Why? I can't remember Graham actually, actually saying, saying that he liked it when Mike was a permanent member. Your Honor, uh, this impeachment is totally improper. The question asked was, did Graham Edge ever tell you that Mr. Moraz was a permanent member of the band? And the answer was, he told me he'd like him to, yeah. And you just testified that you never remember anything about that, right? I can't remember him saying that. Now, did you ever tell Moraz or did, that he was a permanent member of the band? <clears throat> no. Did Mraz ever tell you that he'd like to be a permanent member of the band? Yep. And when was this? I think it was when uh, I was staying in his house. I think it was 1980. You were living at his house, and he said, I would like to be a permanent member of the Moody Blues. Yeah. And what did you tell him? I said, no, I said, I'd, I'd oppose that, and I think the rest of the guys would too. So let me get this straight. You were staying at his house, and he brought up the point that he would like to be a permanent member, and you said you would oppose it. What did he say in reaction to that? He didn't say a lot about it, really. He just act, reacted totally impassively? Pretty well, yeah. No big deal? Yeah. Why did you have the feeling that uh, Moraz, uh, you didn't want Moraz to become a permanent member? So I was quite happy with the fact that there was just the four of us. We'd been together for a long, long time. And I was happy with that arrangement. Did you think that it was ever going to be possible that Moraz would become a permanent member? I never really thought about it. Uh, during that period when you told Moraz was in, uh, that in 1980 or so at his house, uh, was anybody present? <coughs> I don't recall. Had, do you know what time of day it was? Fuck you, Were you, uh, had you been drinking at that time? I think so, I can remember it clearly. What exactly then, tell me exactly the circumstances, who said what? Well, it's pretty well as you said it. The subject came up and I told him my feelings on the matter. That you, was about it. Do you remember your words? I said, I just told him. I said, I would oppose it, and I'd imagine the rest of the guys would too. And how much longer did you stay in his house after that period? I can't remember exactly when in that period I, that, that thing cropped up. I was there, I think, a couple of months. Well, what were you doing during that period? Were you making a long-distance Voyager record? Yeah, I think we were, yeah. Well, it might have been just after, it might have been after that. 
Did you tell him you better be a good boy or you won't be going out on the next tour after the record's done? Oh, God, no. And how long did you work on that long distance Voyager record? I think it took about a year or so. And you, do you have any idea how Mraz was getting, making a living at that point? <coughs> well, who was paying him, do you know? When he was making a living? Oh, You were pretty good friends at this time, though, right? Sure. Very close friends. Good friends, yeah. And you were putting trust into him, and he into you. Say so. Uh, and other than that one occasion when you told that you didn't want him, or didn't think he should become a permanent member, uh, were there ever any other occasions where you're aware of where Moraz was ever told by anybody you're not a permanent member of the band? He's not a permanent member. Right. I don't know. <clears throat> Do you know whether or not the band has been able to save any more money because Mraz is no longer a touring member of the band? I think you asked me that earlier. I'm not, I don't know. All right, we're back in studio with Martin Gold, an entertainment lawyer and litigator in practice for 30 years. Martin, let's, let's do again another Monday morning quarterback on this. <laughs> the decision to have the uh, Moody Blues called, or Ray Thomas called first. Uh, what's going through Mr. Johnson's head in planning that strategy? Well, I suppose he's looking for a dramatic introduction to his case. That's the reason for doing something like that. You know, at the outset, it's worth, it's worth uh, noting that uh, for all of our viewers who are accustomed to watching uh, uh, criminal law. cases, <laughs> and cri look, that's right, yeah, LA that's law, right. criminal cases in general, um, the uh, prosecution is not permitted to call the defendant as a witness, can't even comment on the fact that the defendant chooses not to testify during the entire trial, even though the jury would love to hear from the defendant mm -hmm. all the time. Um, those rules don't apply in civil cases, and so uh, either side can call the opposing party, and that's what they've done here. Now, it's, uh, it's not uncommon, although it's rather unorthodox, and the only time to do it, I think, uh, is when you can open with a case with a dramatic admission. Uh, that hasn't happened so far. Mm -hmm. If for example, uh, they had some documents so that this particular witness couldn't escape from the uh, plaintiff's lawyer, or if they had his testimony uh, in the can, so to speak, mm -hmm. from a deposition so that he couldn't escape from that, uh, then it might make some sense. They might have a dramatic admission to begin with. But here he starts off fencing with a, an opposing party, and I don't find it to be an effective way to begin. And one who says that he doesn't know a lot about the business dealings of the uh, band itself. Now, the second witness perhaps might be a little different. This is Justin Hayward, and uh, I understand he's one of the more popular members of the Moody Blues, so let's hear that testimony at this point. How many threshold meetings were there between January and uh, March of 1991? How many threshold meetings? Uh, yes. How many meetings at threshold? Me meetings concerning threshold records. I don't care whether they were at Cobham or anyplace else. You see, what, what, the threshold is, the, is our office, the office that the four of us own, the, the building. So that's, so, but this threshold, the company, and I, you would have an accountant meeting about the company. Um, so in those two months, we were still recording uh, Keys of the Kingdom and working on Keys of the Kingdom, the mixing and so on. I believe there was two. There was one at the Seven Hills Hotel, which was a accountant's meeting, and then there would be this other meeting. And it was at the end of this other meeting that it was determined that Mraz would no longer be working with the group, right? Uh, yes. Now, <clears throat> who brought up the fact that Mraz would no longer be working with the group? or that it was not a, perhaps a good idea to continue with him? Uh, I don't know. You didn't? I could have been me, yeah. But I don't know for sure. All right. Why don't you now do your best to recreate word for word mm -hmm. exactly what was said and who said it about not continuing with Moraz at that meeting? Well, 
we'd come to the end of an album where Moraz wasn't involved, so he hadn't played the keyboard parts on the album. It says, it's like this television show over in Holland. I mean, it, it, we, we were playing a song over there that he wasn't on, so. So we were talking about a contract calling for a percentage of the next album. They'd already had troubles, and the evidence will show you, and you can just think about this. He's here in Los Angeles, and they have a chance, let's say, to go to Sweden for three days. They've got to take him, his roadie, his equipment. He, he has to fly first class, but his manager can fly second class, and fly them over for a week's tour. It becomes very difficult to bring your keyboard player under those circumstances. And in some cases, they're only going to promote an album, so it's a loss anyway. In any event, they sent him a contract calling for payment by the week to the extent that he worked on the album Keys to the Kingdom. And in fact, that contract was signed. And he was paid by the week, and he was used very little. The evidence will show he contributed very little to that album. In fact, as the evidence will show, except for playing the keyboards, he contributed very little to the other Moody Blues album. For example, during the time that Mr. Moraz was performing with the Moody Blues, some 40 to 55 songs were written by the Moody Blues and were played on the albums. Mr. Moraz wrote one half of one of those songs. Now, Mr. Moraz was disappointed very disappointed by receiving no percentage of the royalties on the album Keys to the Kingdom, and as, as in the, his attorneys said so. In fact, you will see from the voluminous correspondence that we will show you that Mr. Moraz's attorneys complained constantly and took very strong legal positions on behalf of Mr. Moraz about almost everything, the types of things I told you about, other things. But you will see nothing. It's, it's spoken to this guy, and uh, we ought to. Uh, he missed, he missed part, the first part of the statement. What did he say? He said he'd, he'd uh, met, met with this guy, and uh, we ought to listen to him play. And did you have any input then? Did, do you know of any, uh, whether any of the other Moody Blues, Justin Hayward or John Lodge, had any input into the uh, auditioning of Moraz? Oh, we all went uh, to the studio that day. I mean, leading up to the studio, was there... I, I honestly don't know. I would, uh, you know, I, was, I presume that Graham would have told... Well, what role were you taking in the management of the group's affairs in 1978? What did Ray Thomas do? Well, we hadn't worked together for such a long time, and uh, losing Mike abruptly, we were literally, people were just keeping their their ears to the ground, looking and, you know, and listening for a, a keyboard player. Are you saying then that it was, each of you had, each of you was out... Well, look, speaking to people and explaining what we were looking for, yeah. Who did you speak to or come up with in terms of a potential keyboardist for the Moody Blues? Well, I didn't. Patrick was there before us. Who, who did Justin Hayward come up with as a potential well, no keyboardist? Idea. I think, I think Patrick was, uh, one of, the, one of the first people that I, that I saw. In fact, I think he was the only person I saw. Who did John Lodge come up with as a potential keyboardist for the Moody Blues? I have no idea. Isn't it true that, in fact, no one was considered to replace Michael Pinder on the Octave tour other than Patrick Moraz? That's what I'm saying. Patrick came along and we listened to him play. When did you find out that Moraz was going to be auditioning it? Right at the studio? And oh no, it's a couple of days before. And what were exactly? It's just, a, just a, a surprise witness. <laughs> All right, we are listening to Ray Thomas. He is, of course, one of the Moody Blues. He's 51 years old, a singer, flute player. He's worked for a while as an engineer with the group, but gave it up um, before the group gave it up to join the band. He's divorced with a daughter, two daughters, and one son. And uh, he's giving testimony now about when Mr. Morass entered and joined the band. 
Let's go back and what join them now. What were you told now. about Moraes those two days before? What, what, what did Graham convey to you about this gentleman you were going to meet, Moraes? Not a great deal, really. He said he'd, he'd uh, spoken to Patrick, <coughs> and Patrick had uh, explained to him that he knew of the Moody Blues and uh, knew their music, and I presume Big Graham told him what was expected of him musically, and said we ought to uh, see him play. Do you remember having any discussions as to what kind of a deal should be offered to the keyboard player who was going to go out on the octave tour? No, that's all, no. How long had you been looking for a keyboard player before Moraz was auditioned? I think it was only a matter of uh, months, I should think. In other words, in a two-month or so period, you never auditioned anybody other than Moraz. No. And it was also fairly urgent that you needed to find a keyboard player at that time, right? <coughs> well, well, not really, no. I mean, we, we hadn't worked or been on the road for such a long time, and we wanted to go out and... and I was uh, to my taste, it was, ag again, as in the case of the plaintiff's opening, a little longer than was necessary for this case. Um, but what he did in a very organized fashion uh, was uh, to set out what the testimony is that's on the basis of which he's going to come back at the end of the case and argue to the jury that there's no basis uh, for them to sustain the plaintiff's claims. So that's why his, uh, his uh, opening statement is effective. How important do you, as, as a litigator yourself, rate opening statements? Sometimes I, I know some lawyers pass them up. What do you think? I think it's an enormous mistake to pass them off. I find them to be very important uh, for the reasons that Don Engel gives in the article that you alluded to. Setting up that credibility. Well, right. he's laid out a, uh, what this case is all about. Both sides have. We want to get into it now with our first uh, witness. Keyboard player that you utilized on the octave tour? Patrick Moraz. How did uh, Mr. Moraz uh, come to uh, work on that tour? Do you know? Uh, he was introduced to us via Graham Edge, who'd, who'd um, seen the first time I saw Patrick was uh, in uh, the Decker studio when we were uh, looking for a keyboard player. Looking for, looking for a keyboard player. Was that the first time you heard Patrick Moraz's name? Yeah. In the, in the studio? Yeah. You didn't even know that... I mean, you were never consulted on, as to who would be auditioned? I was told, that, but I'd never heard of Patrick Moraz before that. Who told you that Patrick Moraz was going to be uh, auditioning for the movies? Graham did. Graham Edge. Was Graham... How did Graham end up in the position of, as the uh, person who was, uh, what I'm gathering, apparently in charge of engaging potential keyboard players? I don't think it was just Graham. I think he just came up and he said, this guy is... As in the letters complaining when Mr. Mraz was offered and signed a contract to get a weekly salary for the keys to the kingdom, you'll see nothing in there saying, gee, Mr. Mraz had an oral deal made in 1980 that he'd be a Moody Blues indefinitely and would share in all albums and tours. There's no writing making that complaint. In fact, in this case, there's no claim. Mr. Moraz is saying he was underpaid by some dollars, which we don't know yet the amount. Someday uh, we may have some testimony on that. But he claims he was underpaid on the other four albums. He never made a claim before this case. But even in this case, he's making no claim on Keys to the Kingdom. He got his weekly salary, and that was it. In fact, what Mr. Moraz had a new attorney by that time. He'd come here, and his attorney in this country wrote and said, well, you know, he's not getting any money on that, but we hope that he'll get his usual one-fifth when he goes on tour. And those are the decisions you have to make. Is this, is this conduct consistent with a claim that was made in this case that he was a Moody Blue for life and was entitled to every deal, whether he made a contract or not? And, they, and, and Mr. Moraz and Mrs. Moraz have already testified and will testify here 
that every single tour and every single album had a separate written contract. All right, we're in studio once again with Marty Gold. <coughs> Marty, let me just go through a little article that was written about Donald Engel in Trial Digest, at which time he's talking about opening statements. And he says, establish your credibility early on. Don't talk down to the jurors. Be straightforward. Be organized. Was he all of these things and what you just saw? Well, I think he was all of those those things, mm -hmm. and I think it was an effective uh, opening statement. 